In the headquarters of the United States and Russian Joint Control Commission in Korea, there was a meeting soon after the victory over Japan of officers of the two occupying forces. Japanese troops north of the 38th parallel had surrendered to Russia, while south of the parallel, the Japanese had surrendered to the Americans. The atmosphere was deceptively friendly, considering what was going to happen later in Korea. The United States considered the dividing line along the 38th parallel to be only a temporary military convenience, but the Russians had other ideas. After the Japanese surrender, American and Russian soldiers in the area near the parallel could be seen for a short time behaving like buddies. This sort of thing didn't last long because the Russian command was about to turn the dividing line into a part of the Iron Curtain. Two years of effort proved that agreement with Russia on Korea was impossible. In 1947, the United States referred the whole problem to the United Nations. The response to the American action was that the General Assembly established a commission to supervise free elections in all of Korea. But the Russians had no intention of allowing such free elections in North Korea. In South Korea, the people turned out in great numbers when the elections were held in 1948. While Russia was setting up a communist regime in North Korea, these South Koreans were forming a constitutional republic and choosing a president. To this government, the United States soon turned over control of our occupied zone. American forces then began their withdrawal. By the middle of 1949, all had moved out except limited numbers for advice and observation. This meant that the Republic of Korea was going to have only a small army and a native constabulary. Forces sufficient to keep order, but not to defend South Korea against military aggression on a large scale. By the middle of 1950, the North Koreans had a fully trained and equipped army. The Russians had seen to that. The day came when it was revealed what had all along been the communist plan, the invasion and seizure of South Korea. The invasion got underway on the morning of Sunday, June 25th, 1950. When they crossed the 38th parallel, the communist forces brought along artillery and tanks that had been supplied months before by the Russians. They began the invasion with eight infantry divisions three border constabulary brigades, and an armored brigade. The South Koreans fought back for a couple of days, and then their resistance collapsed. When the Soviet began this aggression by proxy, they didn't look for any active intervention by the United States or other nations. That was the Reds' big mistake. From Washington, two days after the invasion began, came President Truman's order that American air and sea forces were to go to the help of South Korea. Aircraft of the United States Far East Air Forces were sent at once to operational bases. the B-29s took off for Okinawa, their base for the strike soon to be made against the North Korean invaders. Several F-80 squadrons in Japan were moved to southern Japanese airfields in order to put them within range of targets in Korea. The original fighter squadron of F-51s was soon ready to go into action from Taegu Airfield in South Korea. The conflict had hardly begun before our aircraft turned to the big job of keeping the South Koreans from being overrun and crushed at the very outset of hostility. The North Korean troops were advancing almost unopposed, so our aircraft went to work on them. First, we put a lot of emphasis on ground support of the badly outnumbered defenders. Within a few days, our F-80s were also going after the enemy's lines of supply, 
We had to slow up his logistics if we were going to keep the South Koreans from being driven off their peninsula. The F-51s, too, went to work on interdiction targets, as well as doing their share in the close support of ground troops. In fact, all of our aircraft gave a fine demonstration of the versatility of air forces. The thing we had to do was trade space for time and slow up the invading forces enough to allow a buildup of defensive strength. So we went on hitting anything that was carrying or storing communist supplies. By now, less than a week after the war started, our airstrikes went well north of the 38th parallel. had figured on having smoothly operating supply lines. We took out a lot of the smoothness, and we conducted these operations without effective opposition in the air, because as a first order of priority, our aircraft had destroyed the small but vicious North Korean Air Force. pressed South Koreans needed help on the ground. President Truman acted quickly. On June 30th, he ordered United States Army units into action. So here in Japan, troops of the 24th Division, part of our occupation forces, made ready to be flown to the Korean battle area in Air Force C-54s and C-47s. These were the first flights in what came to be the greatest combat airlift in history. was the 4th of July, and the men of the 24th Division were not celebrating the day in quite the way they had planned. When the men of the 24th Division reached Korea, they were implementing the vote of the UN Security Council, which asked all member nations to help. Eventually, 15 other countries sent ground troops to Korea. But from the beginning, by far the largest share of the military burden was borne by the United States. The 24th Division troops were immediately sent to the battle line, not as a unit, but by the plane load. This was an emergency. The enemy had to be slowed up. Even without any support from the air, the North Koreans were a formidable force, well-equipped and by far outnumbering the defenders. Piecemeal, the men of the 24th went up into the crumbling line. The enemy had a lot of firepower. They were a strong force, and the most our ground troops could hope for was a delaying action. Our troops needed close support from the air, and from the beginning, the F-80s and our other aircraft of all types supplied it. It was the only thing that prevented immediate disaster. Still, they came on, those North Koreans with their Russian-built tanks. For our people, there was only one thing to do, pull back, wait for a buildup, and turn a big part of the immediate operation over to our air forces. At best, it was going to be tough to keep a foothold on the peninsula. So our air forces became the only effective offensive weapon we had in this early phase of the war. 
For weeks, the chief emphasis was on close support of ground forces. Even the B-29s shared in this job, a new one for these big bombers. The rules had to be forgotten if the North Korean army was to be held at all. The versatility of air forces was proved as never before. When the war was about a month old, we could divert the B-29s and other aircraft to more interdiction raids to keep the enemy's supply routes under attack. By this time, we were beginning to take care of the limited number of strategic targets in North Korea. We were doing a good job in slowing up the enemy's progress southward by destroying today the supplies he had counted on using tomorrow. But it remained true for about six weeks that a major part of our air effort was still in close support. Our B-29s included two strategic air command wings that left the United States soon after the conflict began and were flying combat missions only nine days later, adding their bombing strength to that of our Far East Air Forces. There had been thorough mobility planning for just such an emergency. In mid-August 1950, a month and a half after the invasion began, the famous Pusan perimeter was established. The big withdrawal was over. This far and no farther. The UN ground troops began digging in. The enemy had come far and fast, but now he was running out of steam and was soon going to find things a lot tougher. During the defense of the perimeter, the F-51s had a large share in carrying on with close support and thereby keeping the communists pinned down. The enemy drive had been halted, but there were still North Koreans out there in the hills, and we gave them no rest. It was one of the jobs of our versatile air forces to wipe out machine gun nests that in a normal war would have been targets for mortars. Interdiction was stepped up. We staged about 150 such strikes every day and smashed nearly 90% of the supplies the enemy was trying to bring up. His routes were so extended that we had plenty of targets. This was our chance to soften up the whole communist war effort while our ground forces were building up inside the perimeter. The first phase of the war was over. Thanks largely to our air effort, the United Nations was still in there fighting. It was a peculiar war, but the problems were not proving too much for the United States Air Force. In the summer of 1950, recruits for the Air Force were arriving at training bases in increasing numbers. There was a mean war on over in Korea. And so far, things weren't going well for our side. The Reds were pushing our ground forces all the way back to the Pusan perimeter. Our air strength was proving the biggest single factor in keeping us from being driven off the peninsula. That air strength had to be kept up and increased. This called for a program of intensive training in all phases of maintenance and operation. Naturally, there was a lot of emphasis on the training of pilots. When the Red suddenly struck in Korea in June 1950, our problem in logistics was immediate and tremendous. For this was a war on the other side of the biggest of oceans. Supplies for our ground forces as well as our air forces had to be airlifted in huge quantities every day. The Military Air Transport Service, under the skilled command of Lieutenant General Lawrence S. Cuter, met all requirements efficiently and continuously. The Pacific airlift was a well-oiled engine of supply. The civilian airlines were called on for help and at once turned over 66 transport aircraft and their crews to be used in the airlift. Before long, there were 206 airplanes in operation, including the converted civilian airliners and aircraft of the military air transport service. 
It was the biggest wartime operation of its kind in history. By September 1950, when the Korean conflict was three months old, the Mats Pacific airlift was averaging 250,000 airplane miles per day. The Pacific airlift transports landed their cargoes in Japan in 30 or more flights every day. From here, it was the job of the Combat Cargo Command, organized and commanded by Major General William H. Tunner, to haul men and supplies to the Korean battle zone. While our ground forces were being driven back to the Busan perimeter, our overall strength was fast building up, and a vital part of that strength was in the more than 100 tons of supplies that Matz was delivering every day. One day late in August of this fateful year of 1950, a C-47 from Japan arrived at the Tegu airfield inside the Pusan perimeter. Our big push to the north was in preparation, and there was to be a conference of top-level commanders representing all three of the armed services. The naval group was headed by Admiral Joy and Vice Admiral Struble, commander of Joint Task Force 7. Our air strength was represented by the commander of the 5th Air Force, Major General Partridge, and by Lieutenant General Stratemeyer, head of the Far East Air Forces with headquarters in Tokyo. Lieutenant General I.H. Edwards, Air Force Deputy Chief of Staff for Personnel and Operations, came from Washington for the conference. In the air action that followed, in the 10 days or so just before the Incheon landing, the workhorses were the B-29s. We had 140 of them ready for business. Their mission was twofold, to neutralize the enemy ground forces that still surrounded the Pusan perimeter in considerable numbers, and to attack all Korean airfields in enemy hands. Our air forces flew more than 3,000 sorties in the week before the Incheon operation. In a huge area around Incheon, the B-29s went after marshalling yards, tunnels, rail lines, anything useful to enemy logistics. These Air Force operations left the Reds without any hope of reinforcing or supporting their defenses at Incheon. We were practically unopposed in the air, for we had long since effectively disposed of the Red air strength, which was not going to be troublesome until the MiGs appeared later in the year. There was effective bombing of targets of all descriptions. This was the Air Force's way of helping MacArthur in his magnificent operation at Incheon, which was about to begin. On the morning of 15 September 1950 at Incheon on Korea's west coast, 150 miles behind the front at the Pusan perimeter, our naval elements went to work to soften up the red defenses. An unpleasant surprise for the invaders who had taken over nearly the whole peninsula. A 29-foot tide had to be reckoned with in the deployment of the landing craft. General MacArthur witnessed the landing of the 1st Marine Division and the 7th U.S. Infantry Division. The Air Force had done its part by its hammering of the enemy's ground forces, supply lines, and airfields. On the day following the landing at Incheon, the UN forces hemmed in for a month at the perimeter around Busan broke through. Up to now, the Reds had done all the advancing. Now, it was our turn. Our ground forces at the perimeter were now formidable. We had four US infantry divisions, seven South Korean divisions, and one British brigade. At the beginning of the war, our ground forces had had a tough time. But now, everything was going as we wanted it to. Our air effort paved the way for this rapid advance. It had completely knocked out enemy aircraft and airfields. Our troops had nothing to fear from red air action. There wasn't much effective opposition of any kind as our forces went on to retake the South Korean capital city of Seoul. 
there was soon to be a large-scale join-up of our ground forces that landed at Incheon with those that had come up from the Pusan perimeter for the advance to the Yalu River. There was still some scattered resistance from the Reds as our men moved farther to the north. In clearing out enemy rear guard units, our people were getting good cooperation from the South Koreans. After the Incheon landing, aircraft of the Combat Cargo Command came through with a tremendous contribution to the success of the whole campaign. What's going to happen is that C-47s and C-119s will pull off one of the best managed airdrops in combat history. And they're going to do it in enemy territory, about 30 miles north of the captured North Korean capital, Pyongyang. And not only troops, ammunition, and food, but jeeps, trucks, and howitzers are going to be delivered in this big drop. The first time in combat history for big stuff, as well as paratroopers and their supplies to be delivered by air in the same drop operation. The objective is to trap as many of the retreating enemy as possible and to strengthen our continued advance to the Yalu. Nearly 4,000 paratroopers and their supplies are going to be dropped in the four-day operation along with a great deal of heavy equipment. Exercise Swarmer, held earlier in the year in South Carolina, had been a valuable rehearsal for this operation in Korea. Although at the time, nobody realized that the game was going to be played for keeps so soon. On 1 November 1950, enemy air suddenly re-entered the war in a dangerous way. In other words, the Russian-built MiG-15s made their debut in Korea. Our F-80s take on the MiGs. F-86s have been sent for, but in the meantime, the F-80s do all right. It was in an F-80 that Lieutenant Russell Brown shot down the first MiG, the first of many. Cameras mounted on the wings of our fighters automatically photographed the air battle. As fighting aircraft, the F-80s were decidedly inferior to the MiGs, but our old jets were much better handled. The F-80s more than held their own because of the superior skill of our pilots. a little more than a month after the breakthrough at the perimeter and the Incheon landing, virtually all of Korea was in our hands. MacArthur's end of war offensive had gone splendidly. More than 100,000 prisoners were taken by our ground forces in the first five months of the war. A lot of them had frozen feet 
It can be mighty cold in the upper reaches of North Korea in late November. Some of our forces got to the Yalu, but this was the terminus of the drive. Policy at the highest level forbade any advance or airstrikes beyond the river. Besides, the Chinese were now in the war. We were faced by a quarter of a million of them. Pretty soon, there was going to be what MacArthur called an entirely new war. The decisive force so far in the Korean conflict was our air power. In spite of the fact that at this time, December 1950, our Air Force was still suffering from the economy budgets that followed World War II. And in the new war, with a new enemy that was about to begin, our side never lost the supremacy of the air. It was safely in the hands of the United States Air Force.